Hello, I'm Jacob Zebel with uh, Team Zoox Spank Me Way. Uh, me, Joshua Richard, uh, Richie, uh, Daniel Robbins, and Joshua Hooks will be presenting uh, projectile motion. According to this diagram, we have our starting position to find V naught. Through experiments, we found that our Y naught was 1.17 meters, and our X final was. 2.30 centimeters, and from these two values, we can find our V-naught. If we plug in the uh, correct values, uh, Y-naught equals 1.17, and this equals zero, and uh, we can find the time it takes to get all the way across the, uh, the lab. <coughs> and so with that, we get T, equals 0.488 seconds. Um, then with that time, we can plug in uh, to this equation, knowing that our oh, x final equals 2.3 meters, and our oh, x not equals zero, and our oh, 1 half a t squared equals zero since there's no acceleration, we can find that our V naught equals 4.71 meters per second. So here we have a diagram of our projectile launcher. We place it on two carts to keep it moving at a roughly constant initial velocity in the Z direction, this way. And so the whole system is moving in this direction. And at the same time, we're firing a ball at an angle theta, and we're firing it with an initial velocity, vi, and it has a y component and an x component. And it's being launched from an initial height, s initial y, according to this x, y, z axis. Hi, I'm gonna show you some uh, derivations for how we got our equations of our particle motion. So part of the assumptions for this experiment is that acceleration is constant. The only acceleration that we're experiencing on the particle is in the y direction, it's the acceleration due to gravity. So our acceleration is constant. In order to get velocity from that, you can split acceleration into dv over dt. Then from there, if you move the dt onto the other side, you can take the integral of both sides, take the integral of dv, and you take the integral of a constant with respect to dt. The integral of dv is v, so you get velocity, equals whatever your acceleration was, times time, because you took it with respect to time, and you get an initial constant, which would be your initial velocity, whatever it started at. From there, you can take the integral again to get position, which is s. Your position is going to be the integral of your velocity equation. So you would have 1 half acceleration times time squared, plus whatever your initial velocity was, times time, plus an initial position. And that's where we got our equations that we used throughout this particle motion system. Hi, I'm Josh Hooks, and I'm with the Dynamics Group, and I'm going to talk you through the equations on how we predicted where the ball was going to hit and where to place the ball. First, we start with our givens. Uh, we measure an initial velocity in the x and um, y direction with the velocity of 4.71 meters per second. Then, using the ultrasonic sensors you saw in the demo, we measured a z direction velocity of 0.475 meters per second. To get the velocity in the y direction, you take that given velocity, multiply it by the sine of the angle for the y direction and the cosine of the angle for the x direction. In this, our case, the angle is 45 degrees. Then also to find your position, you have to take into account initially where the ball starts. So the initial position of the ball in the y direction is uh, 0.34 meters and in the z and x direction, zero meters. And over here, we have the equations of constant acceleration. These are the equations that we will use to solve for all the different unknowns. Uh, acceleration is a constant. The velocity at any given time is equal to the initial velocity plus the acceleration times time. And the position at any given time is equal to the initial position plus the initial velocity times the time plus 1 half times the acceleration times the time squared. Here is the calculation for finding the time that in the air. We find our equation for the velocity in the y direction, v 
v equals the initial velocity of the y plus the acceleration of the y times time. And at the midpoint, so at the point where the ball begins to fall in the y direction, the initial vol the velocity in the y direction is zero. The acceleration due to gravity in the y direction is always uh, negative 9.81 meters per second squared. So now we need to find our initial y velocity. So take the sine of the angle times the initial velocity to get 3.33, your initial y velocity. Then, so plugging in zero, 3.33 and negative 9.81, you solve for the time 0.339 seconds. Now I'm going to walk you through the equations and how we found our predicted distances. So first, the x distance. Here's the equation for x, given back on uh, equations of constant acceleration. The initial position of x is zero, and the acceleration in the x direction is zero. The initial velocity of the x is given by the cosine of the angle times the initial velocity. The time in the air is equal to 3.99 seconds, we just solved for that. So simply, the position of the x is equal to 3.33 times 3.339, which is equal to 1.13 meters, or 113 centimeters. Now we move on to the y distance. The y distance is the same exact equation as the x. The difference is that we have acceleration in the y, which is equal to gravity, and we have an initial y position. So the position in the y is equal to 0.34 meters plus 3.33 meters per second times 0.339 seconds plus 1 half times the acceleration due to gravity times time squared. And this is equal to 0 0.905 meters or 90.5 centimeters. And finally, the z-distance. The z-distance is similar to the x-distance in that it has no acceleration and no initial position. So simply, the distance in the z-direction is equal to the measured value of the z-velocity times the time in the air. This is equal to 0 0.161 meters, or 16.1 centimeters. So our setup is basically a projectile launcher on a track with frictionless carts. This slinky provides more or less a constant velocity in this direction. And then at this point is the release point. Pull this trigger and it launches the ball at our target. And these sensors we use to put up a graph on the screen. The top graph displays the position versus time. And the bottom graph describes the velocity versus time. And we use that second graph to get more or less our constant velocity value so that we could do our calculations. Test one, ready, set, go. Test two, ready, set, go. Test three, ready, set, go. Okay. Now I'm going to go over some of the errors that we could have had in our calculations in our experiment and why our values might have been a bit off. So one of the fundamental errors in our demonstration is a human error. When the cart is moving with some velocity in the z direction, we had to have a team member pull a string to launch the ball when it reached a measured point. Now while the cart is moving, it's very difficult to pull the string at exactly the right point to get the ball to fire at exactly where we expected it to, uh, to hit exactly what our target was. Now we were pretty close, but there is always that human error involved whenever we're having anyone manually pull a string. So that was one error we could have had that could have affected the calculations. Another error is that we were assuming the initial velocity of the ball would remain the same no matter what. However, we were changing the angle of the launcher. Now when you change the angle of the launcher, ideally the initial velocity should stay the same. However, there's an actual spring in there, and with a real spring, you're going to get slightly less of initial velocity when you calculate it at an angle due to gravity. So there's a little bit of error in that, and that could interfere with our results as well. So besides the initial velocity angle being slightly high and the human error of pulling the string, 
you also have air resistance to deal with. However, since it was a heavy ball and it wasn't going very fast, that wasn't a huge concern of ours. So there's where most of the human errors come in. You also have human error in the measurements and how we're measuring the X distance and the Y distance. And um, there could be error in the ultrasonic sensor when we're getting the Z velocity. And there were several measurement errors that could be added to that also. But overall, this was a fairly accurate lab. We hit, uh, within a very small region of where we were calculating, we hit a yardstick, which is only a few centimeters in width. And we hit that three times in a row, and we hit fairly close to our Z calculation. In conclusion, these equations of constant acceleration are very applicable to real life. They can be used to calculate motion in one, two, three axes. And by using these equations, you don't actually have to experimentally determine where something's going to end up. You can find particle's position at any point in time, velocity at any point in time, where it's going to be at any point in time, even its acceleration, all from just using equations without having to measure uh, variables very much at all. For example, we only measured an x distance and a y distance after we shot a launcher, and we were able to conclude velocity with respect to time, acceleration with respect to time, even position with respect to time. So these equations are very powerful and extremely helpful to an engineer.